want to say thank you very much for coming this evening. And uh, you're in the best hands because it's a new acquisition for us, and you're highly sought after. Yeah. Highly so I've not been ruined yet, is what he's saying. No, I think. no, no, no. Not <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's just do a check here to make sure we know where we are. We're in Columbus, Ohio, is that right? And this is the website. If you guys didn't know that, I'm not sure how you got here. Um, but uh, there's the Twitter handle for this group. And let's just check who I am. It is 1O, that's right, Groves. I am a... <laughs> Um, I'm a developer advocate for Couchbase. I just started with them uh, just a few months ago. And those are some of my contact information. I run a podcast and a blog. You should all go and check it out. I have some very impressive acronyms there. Let's all take a minute to appreciate how impressive they are. No, but really, uh, I live by this quote down here by Alan Stevens. And I'm not an expert on anything, really. But I'm an enthusiast. I consider myself a learner. I'm on a journey, the same as you guys, trying to learn more about technologies as I go. And so, uh, I'm, as a non-expert to you, I want to talk about full-stack development on Node and NoSQL. So right off the bat, I want to address something that maybe some of you have a problem with here. Some of these buzzwords in this title of this topic. So let's start with full-stack here. Does that bother anybody here? Does that term bother anybody? Because I, I see it's controversial sometimes because, oh, we're not writing, you know, assembly-level IO, BIOS code, right? So by full stack, what I really mean is the application stack, right? The UI, the middle tier, the data layer, and maybe the infrastructure, right? So it's kind of a shortcut term. And NoSQL, that's a term that bothers me. And I work for a NoSQL company <laughs> because it describes what the product isn't, right? It doesn't really tell us what it is. So um, I, th I prefer the term non-relational or maybe document database. But let me tell you, uh, I came with an alternate title for this session, partial stack development with Node.js and second generation non-relational document databases, much less zip to that. So we're going to stick with the buzzwords for now, um, but don't worry, I share your concerns with the buzzwords. So full stack development is basically if you're right there in the middle of this diagram here, you're into the database tier, you're working on the front end, whether that's mobile or the web or desktop app or whatever. You're working on the back end, the REST endpoints, the, the web services, and so on. And you're also on the infrastructure. You're deploying to the cloud, you're setting up the servers, you're installing production hardware, and so on, right? So that's what we're looking at right there. If, if that's you, then this, this topic is for you. We're going to talk about stacks today, and these are sort of the traditional and the newer stacks that people always talk about. The left one is called the LAMP stack, right? Um, so, you know, it's LAMP because those are the first letters of each of those terms there, but it could be Windows or .NET. It's the same sort of traditional stack as, as we've seen on the web for a long time. On the right stack, it's often known as the mean stack, right? So it's a NoSQL database, and then, um, you know, it's, in this case, it's all JavaScript, right? Um, but it's sort of this, uh, this separation, uh, this pretty heavy separation between the front end and the back end. That's what we'll look at. Now, the reason that uh, we see a lot of NoSQL in these, these newer stacks on the right is uh, because what you end up doing when writing those endpoints is you'll end up querying from a table, uh, or multiple tables in this case, and combining them into one JSON result. And that's what the endpoint's returning to your Angular front end or to your React front end or whatever. So some people think, well, why should I do that? Why don't I just store this part in the database and not have to worry about the left part there? So that's why you see that is sort of one of the trendy things about this, about this stack. Here's the obligatory slide about use cases for NoSQL, where it might be a good idea, where relational might be a good idea. The truth is that there's no silver bullet, right? A relational database and a NoSQL database, neither of them was the absolute perfect solution for every problem. So where is, it, where is NoSQL a good fit? Use your brain. And, and think about where it might be a good fit. That's, that's my advice to you. So um, I'm going to talk about Couchbase tonight as the NoSQL database. And a lot of people get into Couchbase for the far left use case there. It's a, it's a really good managed cache system. So people will pipe their relational data into it and use Couchbase as a cache. And that's sort of how they start out. 
And then the Couchbase has a lot of extra features too that people sort of gradually work their way into it. So it can act as a, a really basic key value store. It can act as a more full featured document database. There's actually a mobile component that I can show you tonight as well uh, that Couchbase provides called Couchbase Mobile, which is a, a set of uh, different technologies. Couchbase likes to talk about uh, providing agility and providing scale. Those are sort of the two things that Couchbase likes to promote. Um, I'm not going to go over all these in too much detail here, but these are some of the things that we can give you for more agility. Yeah? Could you say a few words about the relationship of Couchbase and CouchDB? Oh boy, of course. <laughs> Couchbase and CouchDB are not the same thing. Just in the same way that SQL Server and MySQL are not the same thing. right? They both share an acronym. Couch is the acronym. Now it's a little more confusing than that because um, there is some historical relationships between Couch and Couchbase, but right now they're completely separate. CouchDB is the Apache Foundation and Couchbase is Couchbase Incorporated. So they're, they're, they're not forks or anything, they're two separate products. Thank you for reminding me because I knew it would come up eventually. Um, scale. So NoSQL databases always like to talk about scale because they can provide scale in different ways than your traditional big iron, you know, relational database. You don't, you don't have to spend a bunch of money upgrading your machine. You instead just add in more commodity machines to form a cluster. We'll, we'll talk about that some today as well. If you're a Couchbase developer, we have tools for all these different languages and frameworks and platforms. So, um, I might be hard to see in the back there, but I'm sure your logo's up there someplace. We're going to focus on the, uh, the node portion here on the right. And uh, I guess Express isn't up there, but Express is supported too. Um, I'm using Windows tonight on my Mac. I know that may be weird to you, but I like Windows. And this is the Mac they gave me. You can install Couchbase on Windows, on Mac, or on Linux. So any, any uh, pl uh, platform you like. And you can also use it on Docker, on Azure, on uh, AWS, the whole thing. If you're anybody here into big data, do any big data type stuff? You do? Okay. You probably see some tools up there that you're familiar with. They integrate with Couchbase too. Couchbase provides what's called a single, uh, single node architecture. That might be a good way to put it. Is that you can think of every node in a Couchbase cluster as being the same. So this makes setup pretty easy for you in, in your DevOps role. You just stand up a Couchbase server and you say connect it to this cluster and then there you go. You're off to the races. So we have some of the services built in here. We don't have to go over these in too much detail. Um, but one way you could configure it is that every node has a data query and index service on it. You can also say, well, these three nodes should have data, this, these two should have query, and, and so on. It's a little bit more of a complex relationship there. But each node is the same. There's no special node in the Couchbase cluster. They're all identical. To administer a Couchbase uh, cluster, you use the Couchbase console, which is just a, um, just a web page you can go to on the Couchbase server. Shows you all your nodes, the activity, how much RAM is being used, how much disk space is being used, and so on. And if you don't like the console, there's a nice RESTful API endpoint list you can use to do all those operations via some other tool or integration you want. To access data out of Couchbase, there are, let's say, three main ways to do it. And the one way, these are my hand-drawn illustrations, by the way, I hope you appreciate or can even see those back there. Um, but the, the one way to do it, and this is sort of the most basic way, is you can think of Couchbase as a, a giant key value store. Now, it's, it's, not, it's more complex than that, but you can say, here's a key, give me back the document for that key, and you'll get that document from Couchbase. That is the most fundamental, fastest, quickest operation you can do with Couchbase, is a key lookup because it's just going to pull it from memory probably and hand it right back to you. Second thing you can do is you can create a view using a static query. So this is your standard map reduce functionality you see in a lot of NoSQL databases. You define a map and a reduce function. Those are in JavaScript with Couchbase server. And then you say, okay, uh, execute this view and give me back some documents. So in this case here, I'm saying for all those people, I want to map their name and their age. And then I want to reduce it to just the ones that are over 21. The final way you can get data is through something called nickel. 
and that's N1QL, it's pronounced nickel up there, it's a SQL-like language. And so you can pass in a SQL query, much like this one over here, select star from that bucket where the age is greater than 21. And it will return back those results to you. So this is a feature that a lot of document databases have a little bit of. Couchbase has a really, really robust implementation of a SQL language. Okay, enough about Couchbase. We're going to get on to some more Couchbase. Um, we're going to actually start working on some Node now. So anybody here familiar with Node? Use Node? Great. The rest of you guys are all client side or just kind of hanging out and learning about JavaScript? Yep, okay. The Couchbase has a Node.js SDK and it's basically just a wrapper around the Couchbase C SDK, which is pretty common in the Node world, I'm, I'm told. Uh, you can use it in a lot of Node.js frameworks. I'm using it in Express tonight. You can also use it in Sales and, and other type of uh, Node frameworks. And I have this bullet point up here that says reduces coding. Now what do, what do I mean by reduces coding? Um, what I don't mean is you necessarily have to code a lot less, but compared to, say, using um, a relational database, you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of coding on migration scripts or um, mapping relationships from your, from your tables to objects because there are no tables. And compared to something like Mongo, this is going to save you some coding because you can use that nickel query language to do some complex things. So for instance, a, a join or a union may be difficult to do in a, in a Mongo type of uh, MapReduce environment. With Couchbase we have the nickel language that uh, allows you to save some time on coding. All right, let's get to the code. Speaking of, this is sort of a hello world of a node app that's using Couchbase. So I've assumed that you're using NPM, everybody using that to get uh, Couchbase dependency, and that you have Couchbase server already installed. So I'm not going to take you through those, those boring steps of, of, install, of using NPM. So you start by requiring Couchbase. So that's the library up there. Require Couchbase. Then you connect to a Couchbase cluster. And you do that by giving it a URL to your nodes in that cluster. In this case, I only have one node because I only have one node running on this machine right now. But if you have multiple nodes in that machine, it makes sense for you to give it all the URLs to all the nodes. Uh, it'll, it'll figure it out anyway, right? So once you connect to one node, it'll give you the information to all those nodes. But if one of those nodes goes down at some point in the future and your app restarts, then if you have other nodes in the list, it'll go out and find those. So it's good to have all the nodes listed there if possible. The next thing we do is we have that cluster, now we open a bucket. Now I'm going to get to what a bucket is, so don't worry. Um, I'm opening in this example a bucket called travel sample. And you can optionally put passwords on your buckets. So each bucket can have a different password. I'm not going to do any nickel on this slide, but later we'll use something like this, couchbase.nickel query, to start generating nickel queries for Couchbase. And then all I need to do to save a document is say, okay, here's a new document, it's a JSON object, my bucket.insert with a key, and the key can be whatever you want, it's just a, a string, um, it can be a, a GUID or something else, it's just really arbitrary, it has to be unique for that bucket, the document itself, and then a callback, and then, because this is asynchronous, it's going to insert the document into that bucket. Uh, there's no promises yet on the Couchbase SDK for Node. I believe that's coming, but it's not there yet. So any questions so far before we get on to some more code? Feel free to stop me at any time if you've got questions, by the way. You don't have to wait till the end. Okay, good. All right, so I'm going to... Here's a function that I've written to actually execute a nickel query against Couchbase. I'm going to walk you through this uh, line by line here. So we'll start with the signature. It's expecting a string. It, it's called SQL, but it's actually a nickel string you're passing in. And then done is the callback for this method. We, want to, we can't just send a string over to Couchbase to the SDK, so we have to actually generate a query first from that string. So we, we knew that up in the previous slide, the myQuery object there. 
And then to the bucket, we say, okay, query with that query to run, and then there's a callback for errors and success. Yeah? Can you reuse a query with different parameters? Can you reuse a query with different parameters? So um, it's a good question. We're going to get to some parameters in later code, so I'll look at the API then, and uh, we'll see if it makes sense to do that. Is that okay? All right. Okay, uh, so this is probably a pretty common pattern in Node where you see all these callbacks, right? So if there's an error, we'll just write to the console and then call the done callback with the error. If it's successful, we'll call the done callback with the result and then return out of it. All right? So let me take you to a demo here of what I've got. So uh, over here, and all this code will be available on GitHub. I'll have links for you. I'm going to say node app.js and that's going to run my node server on port 3000. So if this is unfamiliar to you guys, this is uh, Windows PowerShell, Microsoft PowerShell. It's kind of like a uh, console, uh, like Bash or whatever. Maybe not as good. Uh, so my server is running on port 3000. So what I've got here is a very simple uh, CRUD app to add people, edit people, remove, remove people. And then over here, I've got Couchbase console, which by default is on port 8091. And I have some top secret credentials here. And so this is the Couchbase console. I can see, um, this is a sort of a dashboard view. I can see all the nodes. I just have the one node. Right now I can add additional ones if I had more machines. And buckets. So the bucket I'm using for this sample is default. And there are no documents in it right now. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new item. We'll add Matthew Grooves, whoever that is. He's probably at grooves.com. So we'll save that. And now he's there in the list. This front end's on Angular, by the way. If I go back here to my Couchbase console, I can click Documents, and there is my new document right there in the bucket. And if I, if you guys can see that very well, that's sort of what we'd expect to see, a JSON document with those properties in it. I've also added a type of user. We'll see that later, why that's there and how that's there. Is it automatically assigned to the user? In my code, what, what I'm doing is I'm just using a UUID library to generate this UUID. Uh, Couchbase server does not generate keys for you. You have to specify what key to use because people use different strategies for creating their keys. Some people use completely sort of arbitrary ones like that. Some people might give some more meaning to them to introduce relationships between documents. So it's, it's really this, you know, a lot of flexibility there for that key. If we go back to here, I can then edit and, oh, I made a typo. Let's change it to Groves. And that's my actual email address right there. So we'll save. Changes have been saved. If I go back to documents here, see that they've been saved and now it's the correct name and email address. Well, maybe you can't see. There we go. Uh, what's that? Still can't see? How about that? <laughs> Eat some more carrots. <laughs> All right, uh, and then I can hit delete and I've got no sort of confirmation here in the UI. Um, so it's just deleting it immediately, and if I go back to documents here, documents are gone. All right, so very, very simple CRUD app. Not, a, not very exciting there, but it's sort of a, the first slice in a full stack of, of an app. So any questions on that so far? Yeah? There's a question about storage, and I'm not familiar with Couchbase. Sure. When you're looking at the representation of a document in, in, the, in, the, in the admin interface, is that... Yeah. Is that kind of how it's stored as well? I mean, it's, is it when you store a document, is there translation going on? Right, so the, the documents are what you see, that's what's stored. It's a JSON document. It, it may not be in that, like, it may not be formatted as nicely, right? It may be minified or whatever, but that's exactly what's being stored, yeah. And then, say, follow up to that, if sure. it's being stored, is it, is it being stored as like a probably compiled object or um, it's not just a string? So it's probably um, I don't know the details of that. It, it's, pro it's, it's probably a string or something like a string, right? Uh, you, some sort for of. Instance, sort of like JSONB in PostgreSQL where you can make 
queries based on uh, JSON properties? So uh, when I get to nickel, you can definitely do queries based on the properties. So it does know something about that. It's not just a dumb key value store, right? It, it can reason about that value, which is what makes the document database, right? In, in my view, anyway. So it's, it, you, you know, you couldn't, I mean, you hypothetically could, but it's not going to have XML in there or some arbitrary format. It's, it's going to be typically JSON in there. And if we use JSON, we can use the nickel language to reason about those documents and perform queries on them. And, so. and without nickel, could you, sorry, I'm, I'm probably just... That's okay. No, it's fine. Fine. This will be my last question. So, <laughs> Ask away. Uh, like, like, when you do just a, a regular storing of a document, can you mm -hmm. store partial documents? So partial documents, that's a, a feature that was just released in Couchbase 4.5. So you can actually retrieve portions of documents, you can save portions of documents, um, which is something that customers, I guess, have been asking for a long time. So it's a very good question. That's in Couchbase 4.5, uh, which is what I'm showing you here, 4.5. So, okay. Is there another question? Yeah, go ahead. Map, map reduce queries? Map reduce, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Is it efficient? Yes. Um, kind, of a, kind of a broad question. I would say yes, they're efficient, yeah. Um, the, the thing that's kind of, map reduce has kind of been there for a while, and nickel is kind of the newer thing that's come along. Um, so. For, for nickel, is it creating yeah. indexes behind the scene to make those kind of queries efficient? Uh, you, you'll need to create the indexes, yes, to make those queries efficient, yeah. Generally speaking, so, yes. So it's storing them underlying documents as something JSON-like. Mm -hmm. You can say create indices, the yes. indices you need for. Okay, so yes. So random SQL type queries would not be efficient. Um, so because so the question is, are random SQL type queries going to be efficient? And because of the way, because of how many documents you're storing in a bucket, right? It's it's a it's a heterogeneous collection, right? It's not just one type of document. It's all different kinds in there. So therefore, a bucket is going to be much larger than, say, a single table would be, right? So an index is going to be, especially as your data gets larger and larger, an index is going to be very important to have in there, proper indexing, to match your queries. It's going to be very important to make sure that those results return efficiently. Does that help answer? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Right. So, so the question is, is there a way to define schema? Uh, and there's not. This is a, it's a schema-less database. So whatever JSON you put in there, that's, that's what gets stored. Right. So you can have, in my case, in this bucket I have a person. I could also store a building. I could also store an, an airport, all in the same buckets. Right. And, and if I store 10 different person objects, they don't have to have anything in common. Right. So there's, there's no rigid schema defined in the database itself. Yeah. Can you do automatic? Put validation to make sure if you enter a, a person, it has at least a first or a last name. Um, so that's a good idea to put in your application layer. There's nothing like that built into Couchbase, at least not yet. Yeah, some good questions. All right, do you have one too, or okay? All right. All right. Where was I? Okay, I'm going to head on back to the slides now. I think. And we're going to look at some, some more code here. So you guys have heard of the mean stack, and uh, people at Couchbase like to say that we have our own. It's called the Keen stack, or maybe the Kane stack. Um, there's actually another tool called Ottoman you could add into this, so it would be the Ocean stack. All right? So anyway, it's, it's the idea. You know, It doesn't have to be Express, Angular, or Node. Right? You can switch these out with whatever framework you prefer. You don't have to use Angular. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Angular. You could use whatever else in there instead. Uh, and the idea with these types of stacks is that you have the front end, which is Angular. This is where your UI logic, your templates, every, pretty much everything about the UI is there in Angular, in HTML, in CSS, and, and JavaScript. And then the back end is just sort of serving up data. It's just endpoints for Angular to consume. Right? So the idea here is all they really share in common is a set of URLs and the, the data that they expect to 
receive from those URLs, right? So I could, for instance, say, oh, I'm going to drop Angular 1 and put in Angular 2. As long as those endpoints remain the same here, that becomes easier for me. Maybe that's not a very realistic scenario, but let's say I have my website, now I want to create a mobile app. I can reuse these same endpoints with the mobile app. So I have two different front ends operating on the same back end. So any change I make to the web app will then show up in my uh, mobile app as well. So if I uh, buy a game on Steam, then it shows up in my Steam app on, um, the, on the mobile phone. Okay. Let's look at the uh, Node.js backend next. Um, just going to take you through some of the, the code here, and this is all going to be available on GitHub for you to look at and play with. We'll start with just a config JSON file. You don't have to call it config, but that's just what we called it there. I put in two settings here. One of them is uh, the server. It points to the, the node. You can also make this a list of nodes if you wanted to. And the bucket, which I'm calling default, you, which you can call whatever else you want. So once we have a config JSON file in place, let's create an app.js file, which again, doesn't need to be called app.js, but that's kind of the standard sort of thing, right? In this case, I'm bringing in Express. I'm bringing in a body parser. Body parser allows us to post JSON objects to Express and Express can handle them. I'm bringing in Couchbase and I'm bringing in Path, which allows us to do some file operations with the, with the, with the file system. And that config file I just showed you is uh, being brought in as well. And then I'm initializing Express. So is there anything confusing about this so far? Does this look pretty... I'm kind of new to Node, so I'm kind of hoping you guys are not looking at me like, what is this guy talking about? How did he get up there? Does that look pretty standard so far? Okay, good. Good, good. And continue on the app.js. Um, I'm going to set up the app to use uh, this, the body parser stuff, which is just, like I said, for posting JSON. I'm going to export the Couchbase bucket there. So there's sort of two steps to this. I'm newing up a cluster, and I'm passing in the server, the server URL to new up that cluster. And then with that cluster, I'm going to open a bucket, and I'm passing in the bucket name to open that bucket. And then the result of that is a bucket, which I can now export and I can use in the rest of my, my Node app. All right. I'm setting up, uh, the next line, I'm setting up uh, a public folder, which is where I'm going to put the Angular files and such. I'm setting up a routes.js. This is where the endpoints are going to be defined. I haven't created that file yet. We'll get to it in the next slide. And then finally, I'm saying, all right, kick off the server and let's, let's serve it on up on port 3000. So far, so good? All right. So now let's go to the routes.js and we'll start by creating an endpoint. Now, the first endpoint I'm going to create here is the create endpoint. This is where you're going to post information for a new person, like we saw in the, in the web app earlier. It's going to start with some sort of basic server-side validation. And this is the only validation I've added to this example. We could spend all day talking about validation. But it's very simple. The first name must be there. The last name must be there. The email must be there. It kind of goes to your question from earlier. This is where that logic would go. And then I just want my endpoint to act as sort of a traffic uh, cop and say, okay, I've, it checks out. Now I want to pass this off to my model, which is a record model, save this object, and then there's a callback in case something goes wrong to handle the error there. So we haven't, we haven't done record model yet. That'll, that'll come later, but that's so all this endpoint is. It just does some validation and then pushes everything off to the, to the model. We can also create a get endpoint. So if we want to edit an existing user, we need to get that user first so we can present it to the, to the, uh, to the end user there, to the browser. The only validation I'm doing in this case is checking to see that the document ID was passed. If not, that's a, that's a bad request. It's a 400 error. So if there's no document ID coming in, I can't look up a document for you. So that's just a validation. Then I go off to the record model again and say, okay, give me that document by this ID. Here's the callback for the error. Again, just sort of traffic cop, just, to, just uh, as, as little as we can get away with in that endpoint method there. We can create a delete endpoint. Hopefully you guys are starting to see a pattern here. Again, I'm checking for the document ID, if it exists in the request, and then I send it off to the delete method of the record model. All right. So that's, uh, that's three endpoints. I think I got one more, but I'm not going to show it just yet. Does that look good so far? Any questions on that? Okay. 
Now let's look at the record model class. So I'm just doing the define a save method here. This takes in the data object and then a callback. I'm going to do some mapping here in this layer because I don't want to necessarily pass that object directly to the database. Otherwise you might get someone forming a malicious request and adding in whatever fields they want to. So I'm saying I just want first name, last name, email. And I'm going to put in my own hard-coded one there of type user. Now this is one way to distinguish between documents in a bucket is by giving them a type field and saying, okay, this is a type user, this is type building, this is type um, airport. Yeah, go ahead. Is type a special field then? No, it is not special. You could call it foo if you wanted to. So it's not special. I should say it's not special yet. Uh, there's other ways to differentiate between documents. Like I said earlier, the keys, you can name the keys something different. So you could say person, colon, colon, uh, GUID, for instance. And that way any, any uh, person, any document with a person prefix is a person document. So there's lots of other ways to do it, but this is, this is one way. And this is also conducive to indexing with nickel as well. So that's one reason I'm doing it. So after that, I'm doing something here with the document ID. So I'm looking at the data object being passed in, and I'm saying, is there a de document ID defined on that object? If there is, we're going to use that. Otherwise, we're going to create a brand new UUID. So what happens is at the end of this line, we're going to have a document ID no matter what. All right? So when we do our upsert operation, which is the next line, taking the bucket and saying upsert on it, we're going to pass in an ID. Now if there's a document with that ID already, we're going to update it with our new JSON object. If there's not, we're going to insert a new document with that new ID. Hence the name is called upsert. It's update plus insert. So our one save method will handle both the creation and update. Yeah? Upsert will not, I don't think. There are other methods, so you could try an insert or an update individually, and then that will return errors if it already exists, for instance. Yeah. That's a good question, though. I'm not for sure about that. Okay? So this is pretty much the same thing from earlier in the slides, and I showed you this already, the how it's going to appear in the Couchbase admin there with the type field. Let's keep going on uh, record model. So this is the get by document ID method. And it has, it's just expecting a document ID. It's going to return one document with that ID. And here's where I'm actually going to write some nickel. And it looks a lot like SQL because it's basically a superset of SQL. So I want to select those fields from the document. So Couchbase knows that this is a JSON document. It has fields. Well, I want to select the fields, first name, last name, and email from that document. And then from, put in the name of the bucket. So it's going to be from default or from travel bucket or whatever. You can alias the buckets just like you can alias a table in SQL. And then this next part, this meta is, I don't think that's part of any normal relational SQL language, but it allows us to get metadata about the document. So normally nickel is focused on the document itself, but the key of the document is metadata, right? So we can say meta of users dot ID, and that'll give us the key of the document, equals that parameter. So this is where we talked about parameters before. The dollar sign one is the parameter that we're going to replace with parameterization. So to answer your question, I think the answer is yes, we can, because we're going to generate that SQL query from the string here, and then we're going to call it with the, this array of parameters, so just one in this case, right? But we could probably reuse that same query with different parameters here. So yes, I think we can do that. And then we have the standard callback and error. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so, the question, so the question is about NoSQL injection, and you're absolutely right. You can inject this, so you've got to be careful. So that's what the dollar sign one is. We're parameterizing our, our, our query. So if we pass that in, it'll be escaped properly, and the whole thing, it'll, it'll handle it for us. Right? Now, I put the name of the bucket in there without protecting it, mainly because it's just easier for me. 
but also because I'm defining that config file. So I'd be injecting myself. It'd be kind of weird. But fun. Yeah, go ahead. So this particular query would get just one record because the IDs are unique? So this would return a collection of records, but it would only be of size one. Okay, collection yeah. of size one. Yeah. There's a question over here? Yeah. So there's no schemas. You could add documents with any number of different parameters. That's correct. How does it deal with the fact that you might have no first name in one document? Yeah. So what it's going to return then is, for a first name, it's going to return. I think it's going to be undefined. So it'll be it'll be undefined when you return. And if you have, so if you have a record that has or a document that has neither a first name, last name, or email. Yeah, you're going to get three undefined fields. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is undefined that, that, that specific like Node.js or is that consistent? Uh, so. So in JavaScript, I say undefined, right? But in .NET, it would probably be null. Uh, Java would be null, that sort of thing, right? It's going to vary based on the SDK you're using, right? Okay. Now, uh, before I continue, I want to say, so to your point about this returning a collection of size one, don't query for one record by the ID like this. All right, I've done this just for demonstration purposes. The better way is to use the get by key operation that's built into the bucket. Because you know there's only going to be one record for that. So I'm going to show you some more, some richer examples of, of nickel later. But this is just to show off the language a little bit in a very basic way. Okay. Uh, here's a delete method on record model. There's a remove method on the bucket. So we just pass it a document ID. It removes that document and uh, has a callback successful. Simple remove operation by ID. Okay? All right, now let's move on to the front end a little bit with Angular. Now I'm going to be using Angular 1 for this session. Anybody familiar with Angular? Any Angular experts in here? Oh, thank God, because I don't know Angular very well at all. So I could be making it up and you guys wouldn't know. Um, actually, this was prepared by a colleague of mine, uh, Nick Raboy. He's, who He did uh, a lot of this work already, and I'm sort of building on, on his work. So props to Nick, Nick Raboy. But, so here's a very basic Angular app.js file. I'm just saying I'm setting up a fetch all method on the, on the scope there. And that's just going to make a HTTP request to that endpoint, get all, and has a promise. So we do have promises in, in Angular. And I'm going to loop through the results of that and set the scope items to uh, an array, or what, not really an array, it's sort of a, a key value thing, right, with the document ID and the result itself. So I'll have those items to write out to my table like I showed you earlier. And then I have a save method here, which is just going to do a very similar thing. It's going to post to the save endpoint. And notice down here the document ID, we're passing in a document ID property from state params. Now, if we're adding a new person to our system, they're not going to have a document ID. So what will end up there is undefined, which we saw earlier, that's going to be fine. Our, our express endpoint is going to handle the case where we don't have a document ID by generating one for us and inserting a new document. OK? So that's all I'm really going to show you with Angular. That's all I'm pretty much comfortable with. But yeah, you got a question? No? OK. Uh, well, I, I can show you more afterwards if you want to. I've got the whole source code here. Okay, let's go on to a more complex query within Node here. So uh, here is, so I'm switching to a different, um, a different bucket. It's called Travel Sample. It comes with Couchbase Server, so if you want to install this, it's like a sample database, like a Northwind, if you guys are familiar with Microsoft World, like I am. Uh, but it has a bunch of interesting information about airports and landmarks and, and flights and things. So this is kind of showing off some cool features of Nickel. I'm actually selecting um, from this bucket the from airport and the geolocations. And I'm doing another query to select the to airport and the geolocation. I'm going to union them together with Nickel. So one query to union those together. That's going to just, this is going to work like a normal SQL query with a union there. So Nickel is not just sort of a token implementation of SQL. It's a very full featured version of SQL that, that uh, Couchbase provides. Um, let's see. So what do I want to show you next? Okay. Um, so that's pretty cool. This, is, this one's a little more interesting now. 
I'm going to select from that same travel sample bucket. And if you look up there, I've sort of aliased these, these things with single letters, so R, S, and A. So if you look in the select up there, I'm selecting from R, selecting from A, selecting from S. And I want to say, give me everything from the bucket. If there's a schedule property in there, I want you to unnest it. Now what does unnest mean? That's something you've not seen in SQL before. Because in our document, the schedule is actually an array of JavaScript objects. So unnest is actually going to flatten that out for us and make it more manageable in a, in a tabular sort of way. And I'll, I'll show you this visually later because it, it took me a while to kind of get this too. And then I'm saying I want to join this bucket to itself on the airline ID keys. So um, each of these routes has an airline ID, so like American Airlines or United or whatever. And I want to join that to other documents in the bucket that give me information about those airlines. So I'm doing a join here within the bucket itself. And I'm going to restrict that to a source airport and a destination airport. So I could say, okay, um, San Francisco is the source and Miami is the destination. And then I can further restrict it to say, from our embedded schedule, restrict it to just Sundays or just uh, Mondays. And order that by name. Now, if you've grasped that all with my explanation, then you are amazing. So I'm going to actually show you, hopefully, a more visual representation of this. Uh, if I can get my mouse to work here. So I've got... Oh, I didn't open my notepad. Sorry. Give me a second. Okay, so I'm going to start with this example right here. Let me make this a little bigger here, if you can see that. So, this is, I'm not using unnest yet. I'm just saying, give me everything from the travel sample bucket um, that has a destination and a source, airport, and join it to itself to get the corresponding airlines. So this is kind of what it'll look like. If I do execute here, you can see the results. This is, so there's different views of the results you can get through in this query workbench. So the table one, I think, is pretty compact. I'd like to show that. But here's a row of data here, right? I've joined it to the airline to get the name, American Airlines. And then my schedule is now an embedded, basically an embedded table itself, right? It's, uh, it's an array of JSON objects of the day, the flight, and the time. And then there's, there's the next one. So there's only two in this case. All right. So that's kind of cool. We can, we can use that. That can, that can be useful for us. But we may want to flatten this out. And that's what we use unnest for. Bring in this query over here. And now what, what we've done is we've taken that collection of routes and we've flattened it out. You can think of this as sort of a, kind of like a join in, in relational databases. But if you look, all these fields are the same, except the flight ID, or the flight is different, and the time is different, because I flattened them out. So is there American Airlines or US Airways? So what we had before was kind of like two rows. Now we have, uh, what's 52 rows, in a way. And this is actually what it's returning is JSON. It's flattened it out into JSON objects. <coughs> and so furthermore, I could now take that flattened query and I introduce this to it, which is just saying, okay, give me the ones that are on Sunday, day zero. So I've flattened out this array into its own, own three fields, and I, now I can query on that and say limit it by just that field. So now I end up with nine results. <coughs> that these are all the Sunday flights. Yeah, go ahead. So behind the scenes, right, it's just documents. So how technically is it... Um, is it walking each document and basically drilling into it and doing all this, or there's any indexing that you can do to make this more efficient to say, right. you know, yeah, so, more for a large collection? So in, in this, in this uh, travel sample, I'll show you the indexes here, it comes with some indexes already pre-installed for us. So if we're querying and we're using these indexes, we're using, okay, where this field equals this, right? It's going to hit these indexes, it's going to be much, much faster, right? Now, uh, what I don't have in this case is, okay, on my default bucket, I have what's called a primary index. So this just means we can execute any nickel query and it will return a result. 
but, this, but it's not using any sort of secondary indexing. So if I'm hitting that primary key, that means probably I'm going, it's going to be slow. So I need to come up with an index to correspond to my query. Um, the other thing you can do, and this is probably going down too far of a rabbit hole, but we can use the explain keyword. And this will show us what index is being used by that query. So in this case, we're using the def source airport index, which means we're getting pretty fast results because it's not the primary index. I don't even think I have a primary index in travel sample. So ex explain is a tool we use a lot in troubleshooting to say, oh, people say, oh, my nickel query is really slow. Well, explain it. They show primary scan. Okay, it's basically like, like a table scan in SQL, right? Well, it's because you're scanning the whole bucket, so we recommend this index. And that's like 90% of our support staff. <laughs> they do all day. <laughs> Those poor guys. Um, okay. So, I mean, we could spend, again, a whole session on nickel, but um, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, flattening is good, or unnesting is not only good for reading, or I assume you wouldn't want to try and post a flattened document back into the. I don't, yeah, I don't think that would work because it's, yeah, it's. Right. Yeah, I mean, you could you could post a flattened document back in, but it would be now a different structure than the the other documents that are already, already in there, right? If I just did that join, I'd have the nested document. Yeah. Document, documents within documents. And if I then right. save that document with documents in it, would it know then to also save the child documents? So uh, I think if you're referring to the sub document thing we talked about earlier, then then yes, absolutely, yeah. And uh, sub-document, you won't do through nickel, I don't think, you do through nickel. You do it through a different API. If you, if you, get, the, you get if you, if you do the join, you get that, that object, that mm -hmm. JSON object, yeah. with basically you get the join documents are like nested inside. Yeah, yeah. Separate as like an array or a collection of other objects. Right. You just take that and then save that, or you know, change some, some values in, in one of those, in one of those objects. Mm -hmm. and save it back. Yeah. Um, so what you so with a nickel result. So the question is if I do this unnesting and get to sort of mutated version of the document and then make a change to it and then save it back. That's that's sort of will that work? And that's not really what you're going to get with a, with a nickel query. You're going to get a a, a, a set of results, right? You're not going to get a document. You're going to get a set of results. Now, um, well, if, you, if you don't do the unnesting, you just have the regular Right. Results. Yeah. You still, you still have documents. I mean, you, you would have a collection of results, and those results would be documents themselves, right? So and so you could then, you could then, yeah, you could absolutely turn that into the save API and, and save that document or, or uh, update or upsert that document. Sure, absolutely. With the, and then it would take the child documents. Yes. Yes, because all that gets brought over, the wire, the whole thing. It's not just like a lazy loading sort of situation. The whole document comes over. Yeah. You have a question? Can you do SQL style update statements? Can you do, the question is, can you do a SQL style update? The answer is yes. You can also do an insert and a delete. And there's some other, uh, create indexes you can do in nickel as well. And there's some other things. There's a whole, there's a whole uh, list of cool stuff you can do with it. Now, if you're, unless you're doing a bulk insert or something, I probably wouldn't recommend doing that unless you're doing some sort of join or something like that because it's going to be slower than just doing the, the very basic, you know, create document, insert, upsert without going through the nickel query. So if you're updating, if you're updating a whole collection of documents, that would be worth it as opposed to going through them one by one, right? But updating an individual document or inserting an individual document probably not going to be worth it in terms of performance. Okay, uh, let's. Uh, how are we doing on time, guy? Am I ready to get kicked out yet? You guys falling asleep? Is there a limit to the size of that document? Is there a limit to the size of the bucket, which I'm assuming is a collection of documents? So the question is: Is there a limit to the size of the document? The answer is yes. I think it is 20 meg, something like that. So Couchbase is not ideal for storing your files. Is there a limit to the size of the bucket? Um, 
I don't think there is. Now there's a limit to how much of that bucket can be in memory at a time. That's limited by the RAM you've allotted. And of course there's a disk space limit. That's the size of your hard drive, right? Um, but of course you can just add more nodes to your cluster to, to expand that. I, there might be some technical limit like, I don't know, something immense. But I don't think anyone's had that problem yet. <laughs> Maybe mathematically there'd be hash collision at like, you know, trillions and billions and zillions of records. I don't know. Sorry, a question? Uh, is, there a, uh, is there a file system uh, set up in, in the area? Uh, is there a file store so you can, can store files? So, so the question is, is there a file store? For so you're talking about if someone wants to upload a, a GIF file or something and you want to store it? Or are you talking about... So some people have done this, store files in Couchbase. It's not generally, it's not a, a, we don't generally like to encourage that sort of thing. We don't like to say don't do it, but it's just not the sort of thing it's, Couchbase is good for. Yeah. yeah. So when it comes to the nodes, is there anything, so if you have multiple nodes running, like, mm -hmm. uh, basically balancing the access to the nodes, or basically, yeah. or if you need, you can you can segment your nodes so some will specialize in certain certain segments of data so you can actually know that that's getting some bandwidth that's that's throttled and you can spin up more of that type of node. Than yeah. So the question is about about nodes. It's it kind of, it's kind of a long answer, I guess. Um, but Couchbase is somewhat unique in that each node is is identical, right? So you get sort of load balancing and and sharding sort of automatically built in, right? If I create a new document. Couchbase Cluster Manager, which I saw your earlier uh, diagram, will figure out which node to put that in. And if you say, give me this document from this key, it will figure out which node to pull it from for you. So it sort of automatically spreads out the data for you. The other question was, you know, can I um, differentiate the machines to make them, you know, this one is storing certain kinds of data, or... Can you start, like, segmenting your data? Se sets, segmenting like, data out? Higher, higher yield, more yeah, I mean, since since it, since it's sort of automatically sharded out, I don't think there's anything like that. There's no need for it. Um, but there, there is. I think I touched on this earlier. A, a node can have uh, a number of different services installed on it, so like a data index, query, and even a full text search is a, a new feature. Um, with a more complex cluster, you could split out those services onto different nodes and say this node is the query node, it's going to have a high CPU load, so let's give that the really, you know, 32 core server. These three nodes are data, we we'll just give them the really big disk drives, we don't need to have a super fast processor on them. And so you can sort of do a multi-dimensional scaling in that way, that's what they call it. Um, I don't know if that, if that helps or not. But yeah? There are performance and you optimize the node to Stores based on key, let's say like old records, let's mm -hmm. older records, and then yeah. as you know, things don't get used, they get shuffled. They get yeah. shuffled off to a separate node with lots of resources, and then so, they get used. Yeah. And so, so the question is there about about utilization of of the uh, of the individual nodes and what happens to documents that don't get used for a while. So, uh, Couchbase has this sort of layer of memory that sits on everything, right? And when a document is, when you get a document, maybe for the first time from disk, it stays in memory um, it, it, until we run out of memory, basically. And then it might, then it get ejected, or at least the value will get ejected, and then you have to pull it from disk next time, right? There's nothing about um, individual documents or individual types of documents that you could you can manage on uh, specific nodes or whatever. You don't have to, generally as a developer, you don't have to think about nodes too much at all. Uh, you, you know, that's sort of the, you stand up the cluster and you add these nodes and that's sort of the DevOps thing. As a developer, you're just querying the cluster. You're interacting with the cluster, not individual nodes. So you can add 10 more nodes to it and as a developer, you don't have to change your code for that. You can scale down some nodes. You don't have to worry about that as much. Yeah. Right, so the first question was, is there any concept of triggers, like in a relational database? 
Uh, Couchbase server does not have triggers in it, at least not yet. I believe we have some complementary partners that have um, some systems that provide trigger-like functionality, so some sort of venting system. But that's not built on the Couchbase server. At least not yet. This other question was on sharding, and I think I touched this earlier. The sharding is sort of automatic with, with Couchbase. There's a hashing algorithm based on the key that says, okay, based on this hash, I'm going to put you in node 2. <coughs> Based on this hash, I'll put you in node 3. And then the, on, on the reverse, the same thing. Oh, you give me this key, it must be on node 3. I'll go and grab it from that node and give it to you. So you don't have to set up any sharding or any organization data yourself. It's just sort of spread out across the nodes. Okay. All right. Oh, my screen went black. I'm talking so much. Okay. All right. So here is the source code. Um, the top one is for, uh, I'm actually not sure what the top one is for, I think it's just like an intro guide to, to Node and Couchbase. The bottom one is the one I've been showing you tonight, RESTful, Angular, JS, Node.js. It's out there, it's the exact same code I'm using. Try it out, see what you think. If you have any questions, feel free to ping me. If you're interested more in Nickel, we have an online interactive tutorial uh, on, that shows you how Nickel works. Go to this address here and you can, you can check that out and play around with Nickel. It's pretty darn cool. It's one of the things that appealed to me a lot about Couchbase when I, when I started here. Um, I mentioned earlier Ottoman. Ottoman is what's called an ODM, which is kind of like an ORM, but for a document databases. Anybody here use Mongo, familiar with Mongo? Uh, something called Mongoose that Mongo has. This is basically our equivalent of Mongoose. In fact, the API is designed to mirror Mongoose. So if you're using Mongoose, you can switch it out quite easily. It's the same API. But here's sort of the, how you set it up here. We can define a record which has these fields uh, created at, which I've given a default value of, of now. Then I could say, okay, I'll instantiate a new record of that type here, the values. And then I could just call the save method right on the record with a callback and a success. And, and that's sort of your, your Ottoman. Uh, basics there, you can do a find with Ottoman, pass in um, some criteria to do a, I think this generates a nickel query behind the scenes. In this case, it's going to find all of them because it's just an empty set of braces there. It's going to find all the, um, what, what do we call them? The, the records. It's going to return all the record types. So if you're, if, so in my world, I like to do analogies to the Microsoft world. This is kind of like our link to entity framework sort of thing, right? Or link to SQL. Okay, so that is all Couchbase server material I have for you. Um, I do have another section on Couchbase mobile, if you're interested in seeing that. I don't know how, much, how we're doing on time here. Looks like we're about an hour in. So I can get through this in probably 15 minutes if you guys are interested in some cool mobile stuff. If you have any server questions, you can continue to think of them and ask them. That's fine. We can always switch gears. Okay. We're still good on time? You're fine. Okay. Okay. You guys want more or not? <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it? Okay. Get the, get the lighters out. Yeah. Okay, so now for something completely different. This is Couchbase and Mobile. In Couchbase and Mobile, we generally present as this set of three different uh, technologies. Couchbase Lite, which lives on your device. Sync Gateway, which is separate from Couchbase Server. It, it manages synchronization of data between Couchbase Lite databases. And Couchbase Server, which we just talked about for most of the session. Um, Couchbase Lite is kind of like a replacement for SQLite. So if you guys do uh, mobile dev, you might be familiar with SQLite. It's kind of a drop-in replacement for that. It, so it's a database that's stored on a device. It does not require you to be online. So this is the so-called offline first strategy of storing your data. And you don't have to use it just on mobile. You can even use it as an embedded database on a desktop app or an IoT app or a tablet or whatever, right? We have um, all those lovely SDKs there. Does anybody actually know what this symbol is? I learned this just the other day. PhoneGap, that's their logo. Um, but Unity, Android, um, Mac, Xamarin, Linux, and so on. Yeah? Sorry, not actually related to what you just said. That's okay. Um, 
So for our unit tests, I don't believe we, we have a in-memory Couchbase server. Um, I could be wrong about that though. I can definitely check on that for you. It's a good question. Actually, there's an article just published today on our blog about uh, unit testing or integration testing with Couchbase server and Docker, I believe, was involved as well. Um, so um, that, you can probably check that blog post out. I know I've, I've written some code for the uh, SDK, the .NET SDK for Couchbase, and there are unit tests that use Couchbase server, obviously, um, but I don't think they're in memory, though. I'm not sure. Um, oh, one thing I didn't mention is that all these three components here, I guess I haven't mentioned this at all yet, these are all open source. These are all free open source tools that are available for you to download, check out the source code, submit issues, and uh, submit bug reports, or to tell me about them, I'll submit the bug report. I'll take the credit. Um, but they're, they're all out there and they're all, they're all available for you on, on GitHub. Uh, Sync Gateway is a way to connect your individual Couchbase Lite databases up so they can synchronize data between each other and even between a, a Couchbase server instance if you want to. Right? So I'm going to demonstrate this. You can actually save some data on one database. It'll go to the Couchbase Sync Gateway and then it will appear on the other device just sort of automatically. Uh, this sync doesn't really have any idea about the individual devices directly. It sort of acts as a middleware. So you don't have to, it's not really super, you know, tightly coupled. Uh, you can use Facebook authorization, uh, persona, all the things like that to manage access to this on your app. And Couchbase server, we talked about that. You can hook up Couchbase sync or sync gateway to Couchbase server. You don't have to, but probably a good idea if you want your data to, to live for a long time. All right, these are some incredibly colorful icons that Nick created, I'm sure. Um, the Couchbase Lite is a NoSQL database. It, uh, it runs in process in your mobile app. Small footprint, I think uh, 400K is what we're looking at for Couchbase uh, Lite. Those icons there mean it's uh, NoSQL, you have MapReduce, you have eventing, and you have synchronization. Okay, so this is sort of the very simple hello world of using Couchbase Lite. I'm using NativeScript. Anybody familiar with NativeScript? It's uh, from Telerik. It's a way of writing JavaScript to make mobile apps. I figure since it's a JavaScript group, I'd show a JavaScript example. So Telerik NativeScript, but this can work in your standard Java or Xamarin or iOS, uh, Swift. Well, I don't know about Swift, but um, Obj Objective-C and the whole thing. So I start by newing up a database. I'm calling it mgrows database. If that database already exists, it will just use that. Otherwise, it'll create one automatically. Then I say database.create document. I pass in a JSON document. In this case, it automatically generates the ID for you, unlike Couchbase Server. This returns a document ID of the, what it just created. And that's it. That's how you create a document in uh, Couchbase Lite. You can do MapReduce indexes in Couchbase Lite. So these are pretty cool because you can build them in whatever language you're using. So in this case, it's JavaScript again. But if I'm using Xamarin and C Sharp, I can build my MapReduce in C Sharp uh, in, in Objective-C and so on. The results get persisted, so it's, it's fast. Right? You don't have to do the whole thing every time. And you can also set breakpoints in this code because it is just your code that you're writing. You can set a breakpoint in your MapReduce to try and figure out what's, what's going wrong. So here's an example. I'm creating a view, MapReduce view. I'm calling it people. I'm giving it a version number of one. And I'm creating a function which just has a document that's, that represents a document that you're, you're mapping. An emitter, which is where you're going to actually emit the documents um, that pass through your processing. So in this case, I'm saying, does the document have a Twitter property on it? Has a Twitter field? Because if you don't have a Twitter account, you're not a person. Just remember that. Uh, and it will emit, if, so if that Twitter handle exists, it will emit that document and, and there you go. You're going to get a collection of all the people that have a, a Twitter field. And then to execute, I just say database to execute query, give it the name of the view, which is people. I get an array back of results and I can loop through those and, and do whatever I want with them. Change notifications are pretty cool. You can 
listen for different events that happen in the database. And this will cut down a lot of cruft because you don't have to keep pulling your database every time to see, oh, did this change, did this change, did this change. And the type of events you can listen for include changes to data, queries, replications, or documents themselves. So here's an example of a database listener. So add database, change listener, listens for anything in the database that changes. These can actually stack up. So changes can be an array of changes. These are the X things that have changed in this particular event. So I can loop through those. And I can see you know, what, what about this change happened? What, you know, what kind of change is this? So one example of a change is a conflict, right? So I made a change to my list and, and uh, Seth made a change to his list on his device. Now they go to Couchbase Sync and now there's a conflict. So how do I deal with that conflict on my device? So I have to define the logic for that. You can also like an is deleted event, all kinds of things you can, you can check for in eventing. Yeah, go ahead. So this listener would get every change. Could you write a function that only gets called, say, if somebody's telephone number changes? Um, I don't know. So you could probably get a, a document if a document changes. And then in your logic, you could say, did the telephone number change? Because I think you'd get the old and the new. I'm not sure exactly. But there's different kinds. This is add database change listener. There's other kinds of listeners you can add as well. OK, uh, all right. So syncing. So with syncing, we get what's called a full multi-master replication. And that's a fancy way of saying that each database in that's, that's syncing is treated as the master copy. Right, so there's no like, they're, they're all their own database, right? And they're all syncing together. You have some uh, capabilities to minimize battery drain to sort of define how often this syncing takes place. So if you want it to happen a lot, it's going to use up more battery. If you want to save battery, it's going to not happen as frequently. This makes sense. And we already talked about uh, notifications and conflict detection. That the conflict detection is what would happen if you're trying to sync things up, right? So uh, if, you're, if, you're, if it's just isolated by itself, there's no conflicts, right? It's just on your device. When we start syncing with other devices, then it's going to be conflict. So here's how you'd set up um, the syncing on your device. You'd say, okay, I can, I can do push, I can do pull, I can do either one or both. Set continuous is what you look at if you're worried about battery. So in this case, I'm continuously checking for synchronizations, which is going to be a bigger drain on the battery than not. And then you say, just kick them off, push dot start or pull dot start. You don't have to do both. You can do just one or the other. All right, here's another fancy slide. This is how to get couch-based lights. I have no idea what those two things on the left are. Does anybody know what they are? Java stuff. That's Java stuff on the left. On the right, you can get it with N with uh, npm, and uh, it's of course is open source, so it's on GitHub. Um, okay, let's see a demo of it, and let's hope that this goes well. This is the part I'm most nervous about in terms of demo. All right, so let's close out of this, and this is another. Um, so I'll give you the link for this. There's another repository for this mobile stuff. It's, I'm using native script. It's called native script Couchbase. So what I'm going to do is this repository has a config file in it called sync gateway config.json. You can't see it because it's not duplicating. Sorry. You probably still can't see it because this is a small font. But this right here, this PowerShell, I'm executing, I'm basically kicking off the sync gateway with a config file that sort of defines how the how sync gateway, there's lots of documentation for that, I'm not going to go into that, but that's going to kick off the sync gateway. Darn it. Alright, so there is a problem with ports sometimes when I close my machine before closing this properly. So I need to do netstat-a-n-o to netstat. Just be a second here. Not netstate. Come on, Seth. This is pair programming right now, live. Let's do it. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. 
That's going on a long time. Okay, and the port we're looking for is four nine. So what happens is basically if I don't close this properly, it Windows decides to hog the port and not give it back up. So I need to find the process 2960 kill 2960. Yes. Okay. There we go. Crisis averted. All right. So now um, Couchbase Sync is running on this machine. So it's going to be kind of weird because I'm running Sync and two mobile devices on this one machine. But stay with me here. Hopefully this will continue to work. So now on this, I've got two Android emulators here. And I've got an app installed on each one. So here's my demo app here. Here's my demo app here. All right, and you can see Sync's going crazy back there because all kinds of stuff's happening. So I'll create a new person over here, Seth Petrie Johnson, and save. He shows up on this list here, and then through Sync, he shows up on this list over here as well. Do the same thing over here, and say, not grooves, save. It's going to appear on this side, not grooves. So, so th th this is not, it, w it wouldn't be going off the name for a conflict, right? It would be, um, well, I don't have an edit functionality on this demo app, but if I edited one and I made a change on this document and someone edited it differently on this document, that would be a conflict. I'd have to figure out how to resolve that with, you know, myself, with my code, right? Yeah? Uh, to get that synchronization, do the apps have to be running on both devices at the same time? Does So Couchbase Lite is running on both these devices. That's self-contained in the devices themselves, right? And then I tell them to link to Couchbase or to Sync Gateway. So they have to be online to connect to the Sync Gateway. Okay, so yeah. if you wanted to be able to send offline notifications, or not offline notifications, um, it's a notification when the app wasn't running, then you'd have to use the, the platform's features to receive the push notification and wake up the application, and then have the application go, go contact the Sync server. So, um, so quite. Don't quite understand. Um, so you're saying if the sync gateway is down? No, no. Um, I'm, if your app isn't running. Oh, okay. Uh, if something happens, yeah. You know, someone, someone else does something. Yeah. Um, say you were running an instant messaging service on this because there aren't enough instant messaging <laughs> services. In the world. Sure. Um, and somebody on one device sends you a message. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're running on there, and it syncs to your sync server. Yes. Um, so, so do I understand correctly that Couchbase itself doesn't directly have any built-in integration with, say, push messaging? I, wait, so the question is, is there a push notification as part of this? I don't believe so. Okay. You, ha you There's probably a, a, I'm not sure about this, but you'd probably have to use the, the Android, the operating system's push notification system to do that. Okay, yeah. so, and that would wake up the app, and the app would manually start syncing. So, yeah, right. So in, in my case, it's syncing right now because it, it's sort of when the app is open, it's syncing. You can also have it sync in the background. You'd have to create some sort of separate process for that, for it, for it to sync you know, while it's not on your screen. That's how the Android works. I don't know how it works on iOS. I haven't done it on iOS before. So, yeah, good question. Okay. All right. So again, that's TypeScript. You can use whatever other language or framework you're comfortable with. Any more questions on mobile? Um, I'm not much of the Couchbase mobile guy, so if you have really tough questions, come see me afterwards. I'll put you in touch with the Couchbase mobile guy, and he can he can uh, he can really help you there a lot better than I can. I'm more of the server guy. Is that on uh, GitHub as well as demo? Yes, yes. Uh, I think I have the link for you. If not, um, I will find it and get it for you. Yeah, it's it's in it's in it's in Couchbase Labs. It's called um, Native Script dash Couchbase or Native Script Demo or something like that. Yeah, it's also in Couchbase Labs. Lots of great stuff in Couchbase Labs, by the way. A lot of other cool projects there. Okay. 
Let's go back to this. All right, so I think that's it, actually. Uh, I've got some, if you're liking these logos here, I've got some stickers. Come see me afterwards and talk to me, and I'll give you one of these uh, stickers. If you're the kind of guy that likes to besmirch your pristine laptop with stickers, I see at least a couple of you here. Uh, if you want to contact me or anybody else, this is the way you can do it. We have a cool developer portal. That's a good place to start for both server and mobile. A blog where I, I write lots of blog posts too. Uh, we have some Twitter accounts. Uh, if you tweet any of those accounts, or especially if you use hashtag Couchbase, we're, we're always checking that hashtag out. We're always on the lookout for people doing cool stuff with Couchbase or having trouble with Couchbase. We're always on the lookout for that. We have a, for, we have a forum. And we're also on Stack Overflow. I'm always checking that. Um, I'm M. Groves on Twitter, if you want to follow me or, or block me, as the case may be. <laughs> uh, any more questions? If you guys have really tough questions or uh, you know, really broad stuff, you can come talk to me afterwards, or we, we're going to go out afterwards, or whatever we're going to do. And uh, we're glad to talk to you guys. And Dana's here, too, from Couchbase. He came all the way down from Michigan just for this. So, uh, yeah, go talk to Dana as well. Very special. Yeah. And um, Matt is in the developer advocacy group, and we've got technical resources resource available to me in Chicago. Um, I have guys come up from Dallas once in a while, and uh, I can put you in touch with them too. For some reason, Matt's um, not available. Benjamin sure. Bryant is um, our stellar sales engineer extraordinaire out of Chicago. So. And he actually, he loves you know, helping folks make sure that they're getting the best out of uh, college base, college base light, and any sandbox activities you guys might kick off after this. Well, thanks again to Guy, and thanks you guys for letting me come out and talk to you. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. You like Matt or you like Matthew? Either one's fine. It's not grooves. Yeah, it's not grooves.